We are on page Chavdal Amud Aleph. Uh, if you're following Narat School 24A1, um, the Gemara says uh, that there's going to be a study of the following points. Siman Demishamek Samach Kuf. What is that? Each one of the things, the names of the people that we're going to address. So we talked about this idea of Rabbi, of Rabbi Hananiah ben Akasha, which we say all the time, Hashem therefore gave the Jewish people many mitzvot. So how many mitzvot did he give? Uh, we discussed, he gave us 613 mitzvot. And then we talked about how Moshe Rabbeinu gave us 611 because two of them were given by God at Mount Sinai. So the Gemara now talks about the condensation, and I don't mean uh, on your window or on a Coca-Cola bottle in the heat of summer. I mean the condensation of the Torah into groups of mitzvot so that they seem to be more manageable. Okay? Gemara tells us, Ba David vehemidan alachat esre. David HaMelech came, and he condensed the Torah into 11, into 11 principles, 11 ideas. Now, obviously, as we said, he didn't say, you don't have to do uh, 602 other mitzvot, besides for these 11. All he said was that these are the things you should be focused on. But within those, those mitzvot, within those 11 categories, are obviously oceans of mitzvot. So he was giving us not less mitzvot, so to speak, but something that's, that was more able to give us, that we're all more able to get a handle on. I'll just give you one more concept about what we're doing, because the Gemara is going to do a bunch of this. I, I injured my elbow over Sukkot. And you know why I injured my elbow? Because we slept in the sukkah, and every night I had to carry the, the, ma- the mattresses in and out of the sukkah for myself and my son. Um, for some sil- silly reason, they stopped putting handles on mattresses. Remember the old days? They had either the string, right, you think, or they made a piece of material that went from top to bottom. Now, on all memory foam mattresses, or, just, there's no handles. A mattress is a very unwieldy thing. It's very difficult to get a grip on it. So you wind up, you can't lift it, but it's not the weight. It's the distribution. It's the ability to grab handles on that thing, to have a place to be able to grab onto it. The Torah is very similar. You have 613 mitzvot. It's just an ocean of mitzvot. And you don't know where to start. And you can't figure out how to double check yourself and uh, remind yourself, am I doing this? Am I succeeding? Am I growing in this area? So what they did was they gave us handles to hold the Torah from. And from those places, we could lift a much heavier weight so long as it was manageable. David HaMelech, Ba David, Vehemidan HaLachat Esrei. Eleven principles. Where do we see these eleven principles that David HaMelech set aside? The Gemara says, Dichtiv says, Mizmor David. A song for David HaMelech. Hashem Yagur Ba'alecha, who's going to live in your tent? Mishkom Ba'akotcha, who could dwell on your holy mountain? Holech Tamim, a person who walks with innocence, with perfection. Poel Tzedek, he does righteousness. Dover Emet Bilvavo, he speaks truth. Uh, Bilvavo in his heart. Lora Gal Lishono, he doesn't speak Rechilut uh, or Lashonara about other people. Lo Asal Reora, he doesn't do, he does no evil, he sees, no, and he sees no evil, does no evil. Becherpa Lo Nasa Al Kirovo. No one who he's related to feels embarrassed by the actions that he's done that are, are inappropriate or incorrect. Nivzebe Nav Nimas. If when a person sees someone who's terrible, who's acting in a terrible way, they're able to look at that and see it for what it is and not to excuse evil. Okay? He honors someone who has If he swears and it turns out that what he swore to do is not uh, beneficial to him, he doesn't just uh, switch his words or not follow through on his promise. He keeps whatever he said he was going to do. Please only answer amen if you're listening to this live. Baruch atah Adonai Melech HaOlam Sha'akun Yibaruch. Amen. Kaspo lo natan baneshech. If he lends money to anybody, he doesn't lend with rebit, with interest. Veshochar anaki lo lakach. And he's not someone who will take a bribe in order <coughs> to look differently on someone who is innocent. Ose ele, a person who does this, Lo yimot le'olam, will never fall forever, okay? So you see, David HaMelech categorized what it meant to be a good person, what it meant to follow the ways of the Torah, 
into these 11 steps. Now, Gemara says, okay, let's try to understand each of these ideas. Someone who goes uh, with timimut, with innocence, with purity, whole, um, who is that? That refers to Abraham. Why? Because the Pasuk says, Walk before me, ve'ye tamim. Walk before me and be uh, whole, okay? Be pure. So since it says by Abraham, walk before me and ye tamim and be whole, pure, innocent, etc., etc. <coughs> so therefore, um, we see that Abraham Avinu was someone who was tamim. We asked the question, why would we choose Abraham and not Noah? By Abraham, it was God's commandment to Abraham. He said to him, you should do this. But by Noah, it says specifically, Noah was tamim, right? Noah is sadiq tamim. And also, um, it says that eta Elohim etalech Noah, that he walked with God. So why does it not say Noah is the example? John, do you have an answer? I think only though, because it says oh halecha, and we said that Abraham is Yoshev's about oh hell. So maybe that's the only reason. If you want to sit in Hashem's tent, Abraham sat in a tent, not only tamim. But just that answer. Interesting. Okay, I like the I, I like the uh, I like the approach. I have a couple of different answers to this question. Answer number one. Let's take a look. The pasuk says, "Mizmor David Dichtiv Hashem miyagur ba'olecha." It does not say Elokim miyagur ba'olecha, and Noach did not walk with Hashem. Noach walked with Elokim. You got it. So the pasuk that says over here, by Noach, et ha'elokim et ha'lech Noach, would not be included because David HaMelech says, who is dwelling with HaKadosh Baruch with, with Hashem. Now it doesn't say Yud Kevavke, but it also doesn't mention Elokim. Noach's walking with God was a God that he was afraid of, <clears throat> that he was living in awe of. That's not what this pasuk is referring to. That's one answer. Second answer is, the reason why we didn't enter into the conversation with Noach is because there's two opinions about Noach's tamim. One opinion is that Noach's tamim was, if he was in a good generation, he would have been nobody. Other opinion is, no, he was so tamim that he was even tamim in a bad generation. Not he was only tamim in a bad generation, he was even tamim in a bad generation. He would have been a rock star in a better generation. But since it's a matter which is up to dispute, when the Gemara is bringing an example of someone who's olech tamim, so we chose someone <clears throat> that um, we chose someone that did both that walked with Hashem, uh, as in not Elokim, right? Like it says by in Parshat Lech Lecha. Uh, right, uh, Hashem says, yud Avram. And the second thing is that Avram Avinu's Timimut is not under question. Is that a, the Elohim versus the Ammonai part? Is that, should that teach us anything about the way we follow Hashem? Should it be out of awe and fear, which we know of maybe that was not the best? Or it, versus- it should be of both. The Mishnah says a person should not be like a student who serves the master for benefit, whether benefit, i.e. plus, or also to avoid minus. So it should be out of love. But then the Mishnah ends and says that there should be mora shamayim, there should be fear of heaven on you. The Chachamim explain that fear without love is really an imperfect relationship. Because it's not one you want to be in. You're forced into it, but you don't want to be in it. So it's lacking in connection. Uh, Love without fear is taking that connection for granted. So a husband that doesn't think he's ever going to get in trouble for anything, does whatever he wants, even though he loves his wife. But it's just like it's based on whatever I'm feeling I want to do. I, there's no ramifications. There's no punishment. There's no, <clears throat> there's no cost to me not doing the things that I need to do for the relationship. So you have to have ava and you have to have yira, And the yira is there to be a, a, a check and balance to an ahava either that falters or ahava that gets taken for granted. Okay, let's continue. The Gemara says, Poel Tzedek, someone who does or works Tzedek for righteousness. Kegon Abba Chilkiyahu. <clears throat> An example would be like Abba Chilkiyahu. Who is Abba Chilkiyahu? He was a great Tzedek, but he also was a very poor person and he had to work 
very, very hard for his, uh, for his, um, to, to support his family. The Gemara is going to go through the examples after we list who they are. The Gemara continues and says, V'dover emet mevavo, who's dover emet? Who's dover emet? Sorry. <coughs> Who speaks truth in his heart? Gemara says, Kigon Rav Safra. Uh, like Rav Safra. Maybe one day they'll say that about the Rav of Safra. But in the Gemara, the Gemara says it about Rav Safra, that he spoke truth in his heart, or from his heart. Gemara continues, Lord, I got he did not speak Lashon Ara. Zeh Yaakov Avinu. It's the first Yaakov, the Khtiv. Ulai Musheni Avi, Vaiti Benav, Kim Tatea. Yaakov told Rivka, Rivka said to him, put the, the goat hair on your arms, and then when Yitzchak feels you to see if you're Esav, he'll feel the hair and he'll think that you're Esav. And Yaakov Avinu says, what are you talking about? But maybe he'll know that I'm, that I'm speaking an untruth. Someone who's deceiving. So you see the Yaakov Avinu, even as a, a relatively young man uh, at that point, even though he's not so young, right? But uh, in, his, in his life experience, or in his accomplishments, he was in the beginning of his career, and yet Yaakov Avinu did not want to do something that actually he also even belonged to him. He wasn't lying to take something that didn't belong to him. The Bechorah had already been purchased by Yaakov Avinu. The Gemara continues, so that's Yaakov Avinu. Who is Lo Asal Re'e'ura? Who excelled in a person that didn't do anything bad to somebody else? She'lo yarad le'umanuto shel havero. person did not get to umanut havero. person who does not infringe on their friend. What does that mean? It means that, let's say as an example, a person <clears throat> uh, opens up a pizza shop, and I'm going to decide, out of the whole city, I'm going to open a pizza shop next door to the guy, across the street. Right? So that might be infringing on someone's trade. That's considered hasagat gevul, like uh, stepping over the boundary uh, of another person. A person did not embarrass those that are connected with him. Who is who is that referred to? That's a person who takes the people that are close to him, is related to him, and he uh, um, he brings them close. So what does it mean by bringing them close? It might be by responsibility. It might be by taking care of their needs. It might be by um, giving them tochacha, by uh, being a support system for them. But a person who, who does that, he is a person <laughs> He does not uh, bring disgrace on anybody else. So the literal translation, right, of cherba is uh, where, <clears throat> where he... Uh, where, where one would have imagined that I did not do something that would have caused that person embarrassment. But the flip side of looking at Khirpa Lo Nasa Al Karavo is that he does not carry embarrassment for his Karov. What does that mean? Not that I didn't do something that makes my uh, relatives embarrassed of me, but rather that I don't ca- carry the responsibility for their shame when I could have done something. Whether it's lent them money, helped them out, given them advice, uh, given them, uh, rebuked them when they did something, made a wrong decision. Okay? So I don't carry uh, their embarrassment because I, I should have done something. The Gemara continues, what about Nivzebe um, Navnimas? What does it mean that someone is, uh, is disgusted by someone who uh, does terrible things? Zechizkiyahu Amelech. This refers to Chizkiyahu Amelech. Shegirer atzmot aviv b'mitah shel chavalin. He dragged his father's bones, okay, b'mitah shel chavalin, in a bed of ropes. What does that mean? It means that he made like a, a like a netting, a net, so the bones would be, you know, held. And he took and he dragged his father on the, uh, uh, on his father, Ahaz was a Rasha. He dragged him all the way to his burial. So instead of taking him in a hearse, in a thing, in a limousine, in a, you know, whatever, he dragged the, the body on, on the ropes. Why, why did he do that? The, one of the opinions is because he wanted his, his father to have kapara before he got to the next world. He knew he was going to be judged. And as we already said numerous times, yesh din lemata, if there's judgment here, then there'll be less judgment there. So he tried to do that, and, and therefore Chizkiyahu, who saw his actions being so repulsive, he wanted to, uh, to, give, to degrade him in that way here, so that he would have kapara later. But you see, this idea of nimzeh, 
uh, be nav nimas. Since you only can uh, get merit in this world, and Eli says, you know, do your mitzvahs because you can't get in the world to come, why would Hashem allow you to now get judgment after you die? Excellent question. Why should that save you? The answer is that when a person passes away, the neshama is still present in this world. And it's tied to the body. Um, so much so that that's when they say about a funeral, when they're giving a eulogy, um, they should never say things, false praise about the person who's passed away. Why? Because it's terribly embarrassing and painful for the neshama to hear <clears throat> those words of untruth said about them. So sometimes as a rabbi, they'll ask you to give a, fun- to give a eulogy and you don't know the person, you never met them. You know, so you're trying to do a nice thing, but sometimes you, if you're not very careful, you might say something that's not, not I remember once, so terrible, a rabbi got up, he was talking about this fellow and he says, you know, this guy, he loved Shul. And immediately, you saw the whole row of mourners like struggle to contain themselves <laughs> from laughter out loud at the funeral. They, they were like almost like exploding from laughter. Like, you know, because he obviously did not love Shul. <laughs> you know? So as an example, we see that the body is still there. So since the body, since the goof, the nishama is still there, so they're still here to be able to get kapara for that if, uh, if it happened to them in this world. But it's an excellent question. Rabbi, how long? Sorry? How long? So there's a diminishing, that's the law of diminishing returns. Slowly but surely, the nishama leaves the body. It's there present during the shiva. It's there for the 30 days. Let everyone is, each one less. It's there for the full first year on some level until, right, until the year is over. But but much less than the 30 days, much less than the Shiva, much less than before the body is buried, okay? <clears throat> so uh, that's why uh, Chizkiyahu took the opportunity. So you see that even though this person was someone that was close to him, he was able to recognize uh, his Rish'ut, and it was, it was something which was uh, degraded in his, in his eyes. That's why he behaved that way. Vetir Hashem Yichaberi honors those that fear Hashem. Who's that? Zei Yehoshaphat Menech Yehuda. That refers to Yehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda. Shebaash, Shebishah, Shehayoroi Tamech Hacham. Even though he was the king himself. If you saw Tamech Hacham, Haya Omed Mikis'o, he would get up off of the throne of the king, Umechabko Menashko, and he would hug him and kiss him. That was the kavod that Yehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda, had for Sadiqim. Vikorim, vikorelo, and he would call him, Rabbi, Rabbi, Mari, Mari. My father, some people take out that, Nusach, either he said, my father, my rabbi, my mentor. Okay. Uh, the Gemara continues. Nishbada Rabbi Lo Yamir. Person who swears, even if something is terrible for him, but he doesn't go back on his word. Kirby Yochanan. That's like Kirby Yochanan. Damn Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, Ehe b'ta'anit ad she'avu lebeti. I'm going to fast until I get home. Okay? Now, um, even though he had no obligation uh, to do that, right? Why, did, why, why, did he, why is the Gemara considering that a case where he had no obligation? I mean, he, he, he swore he was going to do something. <clears throat> yeah? What's the reason? There's no obligation, but he went above and beyond. Sorry? He had no obligation, but he went above and beyond. No, but I'm, I'm saying... I'm doing something bad later on. But I'm saying, why, was he, why, would, why would we think that he's not obligated to do that? He said, I'm going to fast until I get home. Okay. Sorry? So why would we have thought that, his, that, he, that he should not be obligated to keep that? No, no, he's saying here, I- I'm not going to fast until I get home. Sorry? I'm going to fast until I get home. So now we're saying, oh, look how special. He kept his word and he didn't break his neder. there. What? Okay. You're obligated to do that. Once you said you're going to fast until you get home, you're keeping your promise. Why, why would we think that you're not obligated to do so? As you learned in Gemara Ta'ani. Yeah. 
it just doesn't it doesn't hold. He didn't accept the fast from before, so there were things that he could have broken his fast for. Oh, that's interesting. The only thing that I would disagree with you on is that's in in setting a ta'anit. Here, he made a neder on something. So as an example, if I do not accept ta'anit by mincha the day before, so it's not a ta'anit. But here, I'm making a specific neder. It says that he was trying to avoid eating somewhere else. So how does that help? (laughs) Okay. Maybe it wasn't a valid vow. Sorry? It wasn't a valid vow. Who's the Why not? That's what the note says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to ask why. I want you to think. So take a look for a second. Take a look at Rashi. You see Rashi on the inside? Tamar <laughs> Yochanan. Pa'amim. You see it? In the inside column, about uh, 75% of the way down the page. Tamar <laughs> Yochanan. Pamim Shaya Omer, there were times he would say, I'm going to be in a, in a ta'anit until I get to my house. If he would come to his house in two or three hours, he would eat, and he would call that fasting. So Rashi over here is maybe saying it a little bit differently than one might think. Time. Sorry? Related to time? Yeah, in other words, Rashi is translating it in Ta'anit that Yochanan said, I'm going to fast until I get to my house. It doesn't count. As well. Now he gets to his house an hour later. Rabbi Yochanan would fast after that point. Why? Because the Ta'anit is not for an hour. So the Gemara is saying, now look at Rabbi Yochanan how he fasted for, for more than he was obligated to. Why? Because a ta'anit is really a ta'anit of a full day. So now he got to his house two hours later. It's not a full day, but I said, I'm in a ta'anit. I'm in a fast. It's not a fast. For the rest of the day is a fast. Until shkiah. So Yochanan would wait. Rashi is uh, understanding the situation of Yochanan in a different way. So what Ray and Jonathan us are quoting from the notes a little bit of a different thing, is that it was an, from an intention point of view. In other words, what he was saying to them was, listen, uh, I don't want to come to you, I'm, I'm not going to eat anything until I get home. Right? Now, did he mean that he's not going to eat anything until he gets home? No. He's just telling the guy who fadaled him, right, I'm not going to eat anything until I get home. Maybe he meant, I'm not going to have a meal, Maybe he meant, you know, I don't want, I want to maintain my, but let's say he wants to eat an apple now. That's not what he meant. That's not what he was mekabel on himself. You could open up the net that by finding a, a, a loophole, loophole yeah. right? So Rabbi Yochanan did not do that. But is it even considered a net there? When someone says, I will, so in other words, I will give you $100. That's not a lashon neder. You know how we say ben bil shon neder. That affects someone else. Okay, l- whatever. So I, I will study pirkei avot. Okay. Today. Oh, today. I have to do that. I must do that. It's like a neder. That's why we say in hatarat nederim ben bil shon neder, ben bil shon shua, ben bishum lashon. In whatever language I say that I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna do something. Now, of course, it's more if it's a neder. there. Okay, let's continue. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan was an example of that. Kaspol on the the guy did not lend with interest. Afilu birebit oved kochavim. What does it mean that a person, David HaMelech, gave you 11 things to do? He said don't lend with interest, even to someone who's not Jewish. Wow, huh? He does not take a bribe in order to think differently about someone who's clean. Um, where the person had an obligation to pay him, okay? But he didn't have to pay him yet. But the reason why he would, was afraid to take the payment of something that was owed to him was because since it was early, then that was a nice thing for him. But now, if I have a court case with you, I might look favorably at you by taking this bribe. Okay? The bribe is taking the money a day early. A day early. 
Why? Like, I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say someone owes you $500 tomorrow. Or you could have forty-nine fifty, but today. How much would you pay to have the money that's owed, owed to you tomorrow now in your hand? Okay, I'll give yeah. up the 50 cents. Has a 50 has a value, some value. Okay? Right? Let's say it was a far greater amount of money. Okay, I owed you five million dollars. And, and he's like, I have it now, or I could pay you next time. I'll pay tomorrow. You want to take that money, right? And there's a value to having that money now. Number one, who knows if the guy's gonna spend it on something maybe he won't have it. Number two, um, what's it called? Who knows anything could happen to him. Number three, what's it called? Um, the money in my possession one day earlier means that if I invested it today in something, I'm making money on having that money earlier. It's one more day of, you know, of interest, of dividends, of whatever, of investment. So however small that value is, Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Yossi was so careful not to take a bribe to be able to look differently at someone that was innocent. In this case, he was worried it might be the a case that the sharecropper was bringing against Somebody else. Let's continue. Rabbi, how come we don't, we don't put this no, in he didn't take it. He didn't take it at all. Sorry? <laughs> how come we don't put this in a tifila? Like when we say the there's 13 dot that we follow, wouldn't this be these 11 things, you know, as sort of almost like a, uh, you know, guidelines to follow every day? Uh, you just wait, and then you'll tell me if you still have the question, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now I continues, all right? Ktiv, it says... On these 11 things that David Amir mentioned, this guy, if a person does this, he'll never fall forever. When Rabbi Gamliel would read these words, by the way, this is the words written by Rabbi Gamliel's great, great, great grandfather, David Amir, okay? Uh, Rabbi Gamliel would start to cry. What that tells you is, who, who doesn't fall? A guy who did these, all of them. Ha, But if someone did only one of them, and not the rest, yimot, not yamut to be to be clear. Yimut yamut means to die. Yimot means to fall. Okay. Okay, we said it. So, he, so Rabbi Gamliel was saying, "Look, you need to perfect at least all of them, not one of them, because as Ose ele lo yimot." Gemara continues. Amru they said, "Mik tiv." Does it say Ose kol ele? Does it say all of these? It says Ose ele. Someone who does these ketiv. Maybe the pasuk means afilu chada minayo. Maybe it means even if you manage to excel in one of these things, it's enough. Because if you do not learn, someone who does these, you won't fall. Meaning, if you didn't do, if you did one of these, you won't fall. If you don't believe that, let's look at another verse. The Pasuk says, you're going to love this one, right? Don't defile yourself with all of these uh, adultery or immorality cases. Hatam nami. Over there you're going to say, that you're impure if you do all of the actions of adultery. you got to sleep with your sister and your mother and someone else's wife and the thing and uh, all the possible adult and a dog and a horse and a, and a man. and a, right? you got to do all the acts of immorality in order to be impure. But if I did all of them except for one, I'm kosher. Right? Same thing. It says, So obviously, therefore, uh, it means when it says don't be pure in these, it means in any of these. So so to here when it says you won't fall if you do these, it means in any of these. Rather with all with even just one of these, just like over there, even just one of those makes you impure. So too, here, even if you did just one of these, it makes you uh, someone who the Pasuk says about them, lo yimot. Now, uh, as time went on, all right, um, and we moved on from David HaMelech's level of, of uh, Kedusha, um, the Gemara reaches 
the prophet Yeshaya. Now, hold on one second. The prophet Yeshaya, in t- time wise, when does he fall? Anyone know? Is after the destruction? No. No. Yeshaya, who who is his famous interaction with? The king Hezekiah. Okay, so Hezekiah, God tells Hezekiah he's going to die. Why? Hezekiah was a king, and he was a very righteous king. Yeah, and Yeshaya comes to him. He tells him he's going to die. And Hezekiah says, "What do you mean? Why?" He says, "Because you never married." The Torah says, "I have an obligation for a king to ignore uh, such an important mitzvah. Where the people is uh, punishable by death. He's sick in his bed. He's sick in the sickness that's going to be his end." So Chizkiyahu says to Yeshaya, "The reason why I didn't marry is because I saw with prophecy that the child I'm going to have is going to be a terrible rasha, and he's going to lead all the Jewish people astray." Who's Chizkiyahu's son? Jesus. No. <laughs> but, but by the way, not, someone not much better. Okay? Someone not much better. So Chizkiyahu says, I see with prophecy he's going he's gonna to take all the people to Abu Dazara. And terrible things. Yeshaya told him, it's not your job to look into the future and decide whether or not you should do a mitzvah. That's heaven's part. In the, in the equation. You have an obligation to do all the mitzvot in the Torah. You don't avoid something because you have a prophecy about how it's going to turn out. Right? So Chizkiyahu says, okay. All right, I hear you. Give me your daughter. Oh. <laughs> Maybe between my merit and your merit, the prophecy will be changed. Yeshayahu tells him, No. <laughs> He leaves, God's like, <laughs> go back in there. <laughs> and Chizkiyahu marries the daughter of Yeshaya. And who's the child? Menashe. King Menashe that leads the whole Jewish people to Abu Dazara. So his prophecy was not wrong. It was correct. And the merit of Yeshaya and Chizkiyahu was not enough to change the trajectory of, uh, of Menashe. Did he still do the right thing? Yes. Because it's not your job. You have to do the mitzvot. The Torah doesn't say you should get married, have children, unless you're a prophet and you see that they're not going to be great. It doesn't say that. It's all right? Like yeah. Um, so what's interesting is that <clears throat> uh, the Pasuk over here is telling us that Yeshayahu who is the Navi at the time of Chizkiyahu, he sees where things are heading. Okay? Maybe, I don't know if this was before or after, but maybe because of his conversation with Chizkiyahu, by Yishayahu v'himidan al-shesh, he's like, there's 11, these 11 categories, too many. He narrows it down to six. What are the six? Dikhtiv? Because Chizkiyahu said, sorry, Yishayahu said, Holech tzedakot, Person who walks with tzedek, with righteousness, vidover mesharim, and he speaks mesharim straight, everything fair. Moes bebetza mashakot, the guy he turns away uh, something which is betza, which comes from thievery, from forcing someone to give you uh, 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 that that extra money, or whatever. Noer kapav mitmoch ba he uh, like. Menaer means to, to, to shake off. He shakes off his hands from supporting uh, or from uh, standing by Shochad uh, a bribe. Otem Ozno Mishmoa Damim closes his ears from uh, if anyone wants to tell him of, uh, of terrible things. And he closes his eyes from seeing something which is evil. A person uh, does those things, uh, then He's, he's a, he, that's the type of person that's following in the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Gemara says, okay, what does this mean? Holech tzedakot ze Avraham Avinu. Tara first, Avraham. Tichtiv, because it says, ki yedativ l'manashe yitzaveh. I know him that I have, that he will command. L'manashe yitzaveh, banavet v'toh harai. 
He's going to command his children, his family, uh, to follow in my ways. V'shamiru derech Hashem. And they're going to guard the way uh, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay? Um, <clears throat> you want to see the Pasuk? You see it's number Vav. And what is it? What, how will they follow the ways of Hashem? La'asot tzedakah u mishpat. So you see, Avraham Avinu trained the people to be holech tzedakot. Okay? The Gemara continues with the Ver Misharim. And he speaks with, only with fairness. Zeh she'enu maknit pnei haverot berabim. What does it mean that he speaks? Misharim means to be something which is smooth, which is straight. That's a person who does not fight with or humiliate his friend in public. So it's interesting. We would have thought Dover Meshari means to speak in a way which is, uh, which is honest. He's to talk straight. Yeah? But you see over here that it actually Gemara is explaining that it means that you're not embarrassing someone in front of anybody else. I would not have categorized that as speaking with fairness. But there you go. That's why I'm not the Gemara. The Gemara continues. Mo'es bebetza me'ashakot. He turns away all sorts of... Uh, 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 ill-gotten gains that he forced to add a people. Go to Bishmael ben Elisha. That Bishmael ben Elisha, uh, whenever uh, the, they would come to him, he was a, a big kohen, and whenever they would come to him and they would try to give him gifts, what would he do? He would tell them, "Don't give it to me. Give it to another kohen." Okay. So you see that why why was he doing that? How come he refused to take all these uh, various uh, uh, kohanim? Right, the 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 uh, the reason is because he felt that listen, every guy has their own kohen, you know, every guy has a kohen that they're friends with, and you're always giving to that guy. How come you're giving to me now? You're giving to me now because you're seeing me. I'm a big rabbi, but meanwhile, this money it really should go to the person that you always give to. So therefore, he didn't want to touch something that was taken away uh, in a in a manner uh, which was uh, extortion. But so interesting to see the level of Kiddushah that he had, that he felt that his level of Kiddushah was forcing the person to give. What's the shokhat level? Like what's, the, what's the bribery component of that? If he's taking, I'm not saying it's right. No, 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 that's not shokhat. It's the one before. That's mo'es bebetza me'ashakot. Okay, so he didn't want something which was taken, which was forcibly taken from somebody. He considered his status as a rabbi when all of a sudden the person gave him something, he obviously felt compelled to give it to me. You know why? Never gave it to me before. That means he's got a kohen that he always gives to. Why is he giving it to me today? Maybe I was walking as a big rabbi and it kind of, he maybe he felt like pressured into giving it to me. And that's why he would tell, tell them to give it back to the kohen they would normally give to. He shakes his hands off. He doesn't want to support uh, the case of Yishmael ben Abiyosi that we mentioned earlier that uh, he would shake out from his hands taking shochat. Why are we calling it shake out from his hands? Because normally when you take something, you, you put it in your hands. You want to get rid of it, you take it, you, you, get, you, you, know, you drop it. When you're shaking it off, it means I'm worried that something is stuck on, is stuck to my hands. He was going, he was going above and beyond the level of drop because it wasn't, it was, it was owed to him. This was his money that's being paid to him. He's just being paid, just getting it early. When I continues, he does he closes his ears from hearing bloodshed. That doesn't sound like a good thing. If someone is telling you about someone who's, you know, right. guilty, surely I should listen to that. Right. When I says, no, what is it talking about? Right. If someone made a comment about a great rabbi, he would not listen to that and, and, and be quiet. But rather, if he heard someone speaking that way about somebody, what would he do? He would speak up. Now, what is that? Why is that connected to hearing spilling of blood? The answer is, we mentioned already earlier many times, that if someone embarrasses someone in public, ki'ilu, it's as if, right? ki'ilu horgo, it's as if you killed him. So therefore, if you he, if he heard someone literally doing character assassination, he wouldn't sit by and just say, look, you know, it's not worth the fight. This guy's a moron, right? He actually would engage and say, it's not true. You don't know. 
Uh, the rabbi is a very special it's person. Only to rabbis? No, he stepped In up. In this sentence, he's saying it's only, it's only about the, the It's a good question. I think the point over here is where he know that just illustrates the <clears throat> that he knows. Because they're beyond reproach. Is that why they mention? But the question is, if we're talking about Mishmo um, Adamim, Mishmo Adamim is, uh, what's it called? Is for anyone. So why does it say, Dafka Tzuvah Right? So, the king has Hezkiah who live? I know he lived enough. Yes, 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 he, he, he recovered after that, yeah. All right, so why does it mention only, why does it mention only Chachamim? A character assassination is considered like you're murdering them, no matter what the level of the person is. So why, why are we only saying it uh, for Chachamim? I think the answer is that that's a scenario where you know for sure you can't keep your mouth shut because of the level of the person. Okay, one last piece, I'll just add. We're obviously, maybe we're not talking, not obviously, maybe not talking about where someone just speaks negatively about someone. We know that the Gemara says if, you, if a, a person who's a righteous person, a tzaddik, they do something wrong, ba'erev, in the evening, in the morning, you should already assume he must have done teshuvah. If it's so out of character, the guy never does anything wrong. Also, you see this guy do something in the evening. In the morning, don't think he still has that avera in his hands. He must have done, at that point, he must have done Teshubah because he's such a great tzaddik and everything else. Your, your, your experience with him tells you that he would not, he made a mistake, but he was not going to. So the answer is, we're talking about a case where someone is talking Biziluta of something that you know is true. So when do you obligate it to argue with the person only by Tzubah Merabanan? Because if they're not Tzubah Merabanan, I know it's true. Why should I not listen? I saw it with my own eyes. The answer is, by Tzubah Merabanan, you need to stand up, even if you saw it, because of this halakha. Uh, in the morning, al tehera ar-acharaf. Kegon Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Shimon was very, very careful with the honor of Tamidei Chachamim if anyone spoke up against them. Ve'otzem enav mirot bera. Person closes his eyes from seeing evil. Kedre b'chiriyat, like the words of Rabbi Chiriyat, Rabbi Chiriyat Rabba, zeshinu mishtakem menashim isha, shomdot ala kivisa. This is a person who's not watching the ladies when they were engaged in washing the, the clothing, uh, obviously, it might, it might, why specifically? You know, on the clothing, maybe be because they're bending over the river, they're standing in a way where a person might be uh, tempted to look at them, to see them in that way. So the Gemara uh, mentions, or maybe as well, if their clothing becomes wet and therefore it's become see-through. So the idea that someone is watching someone in the time of Kivisa, that's Otsim Enav Amir Otbera. The guy, he tries to avoid looking at things that are not correct to, to look for. And what does it say about these six things? The Pasuk says, Hu mishkon. Take a look at the side, because that, that's not giving us the whole Pasuk. Hu mishkon, right? He dwells on high, okay? Mitzarot, mitzadot slaim, mitzgabo lachmon itam imav neemanim. So the Pasuk says about this guy, about this person who achieves these, uh, these levels that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to be there for him, the one who dwells on high. Hu ba meromim yishkon, mitzdot tzedaim mizgabo lachmo, nitem imav neemanim. He's going to give the person all beracha. So you see that these are the six uh, categories that Yeshaya took the 11 from and narrowed it down to six. So Jonah, that's your answer. The reason why we don't do 11 is because at a certain point we realized that was too much, so we narrowed it down to six. We're going to see next time in the Gemara that the Gemara now narrows it again, and then narrows it again, until uh, we're left with one thing in our hands to try and be the head of the spear uh, for all of the Torah. Baruch